Hey everyone, I'm Captain Phil White, go by Queso. I'm a pilot here with the 41st Rescue Squadron at Moody Air Force Base, and today we're gonna to talk about the HA-60G Pavehawk. This is the Air Force's uh, sole rotary wing personnel recovery platform. Uh, it's based on the Army Blackhawk with a bunch of additions. This aircraft is normally flown with a crew of four up front, so we've got two pilots and then two enlisted special missions aviators or back-enders in their gunner seats, and then another uh, crew of three or four PJs in the back uh, for a total crew of about seven or eight people. We employ these helicopters in two ships, so we'll have a formation of two, which means we're gonna have like a six to eight uh, person PJ team on the ground uh, when we're doing that, uh, any missions. But our, our main mission is personnel recovery or what we term combat search and rescue. So if a pilot is flying around in enemy territory and gets shot down or for whatever reason has to eject, our job is to be ready to go. We'll take off really quickly, go fly out there and pick them up and then bring them back so that they can either uh, be with their family or go and start re-accomplishing uh, re the mission. So this tail, specifically 356, is our heritage tail here at Moody. We are getting the, we're the first operational unit in the Air Force to get our new combat rescue helicopter, the HX-60 Whiskey Jolly Green 2. And so in order to pay homage to the uh, HX-60G, or homage as our French exchange pilot would always remind us, uh, we repainted this in the original colors of the Payfoc, which is that green and gray camouflage. So if you notice down the flight line, the rest of the aircraft are all painted dark gray. This one is, that dark gray, but also some green to, again, pay, pay homage or homage to that rescue heritage. So coming down the nose of the aircraft on the pilot side here, we've got a couple different sensors. Uh, this sensor right here is our missile warning sensor. That's designed to automatically detect missiles that are launched at us, so the aircraft can automatically dispense uh, flares for countermeasures. Uh, that's a fairly common system across the Air Force. Additionally, we have an RWR antenna here, a radar warning receiver. So if any kind of a threat radar, or even a friendly radar paints us with radar, this one of the this one of four antennas will then talk to the radar scope that we have inside the aircraft and let us know uh, where that radar is coming from and also what it is and then lastly we've got an infrared probe light right here so fairly low tech but it's great for doing ar at night especially on really dark nights we can crack that probe light on just a little bit and uh it shines on the probe but also what it does is the probe creates a nice shadow on the drogue and so that's a really good way if you keep the shadow at about the two o'clock on the drogue that is a nice way to keep the aircraft uh, probe lined up, especially when you're sitting on the co-pilot side, because you're kind of looking across the cockpit and at this weird angle to the probe. Uh, that's a really good way to line yourself up for a good plug. Uh, coming down the side of the aircraft, we'll do the cockpit in a little bit. Obviously, we've got the aircraft doors. Like I said, this is our heritage tail, so it's got our wing commander's name on it. Uh, Bones there, he uh, has been flying the 60 for quite some time. Um, this is a really important spot right here. This is the step to get into the pilot seat. Uh, obviously, you don't want to look like a, a a goof by uh, falling out of the aircraft. Uh, every once in a while when you get out after a long sortie, you miss the step and uh, might eat it. But uh, that's really important for that step there. Up here, uh, right above the gunner's window, that's one of the uh, pitot tubes for uh, airspeed. Obviously, it's got a uh, cover on it, so debris and bugs and that kind of stuff don't get in there. Uh, but that's one of the, the pitot tubes for the aircraft. This aircraft is configured a little bit differently than we normally fly because we uh, have the 50 cal on this side and the minigun on the other. Um, but uh, this gives us an opportunity to talk about the different weapon systems. Uh, this is the GAO 18 uh, 50 caliber machine gun. This is crew served by one of our special missions aviators or back as we call them, uh, who ride in the back. So normal crew for an H-60G is two pilots up front, uh, two SMAs or back uh, riding behind them, and then a, about two to three PJs in the back of the aircraft. And we normally fly in a formation of two, so we'll have double that number, so about a team of six uh, for the PJs. Obviously this 50 cal is crew served, all of the ammunition is stored in this box right here and it holds 600 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. Uh, we do use an armor piercing incendiary round for deployments, which has a new, nice little explosion every time it hits something. So this is a very effective weapon against uh, like light skinned vehicles, even some light armor, as well as uh, dismounted troops. And again, the back ender shoots this, so they open this gunner's window and they can manipulate this weapon from inside the cabin. And they can also lock it forward and uh, in azimuth and in elevation, similar to that. Obviously the uh, top of the gun's open and when we can shoot it from the front uh, of the aircraft as well. So the pilots uh, can shoot these 50 cals off the nose. Um, in certain situations, it does allow us to get a little bit uh, more accurate and a little bit uh, more rounds on the target, especially from long distance. Going down the side of the aircraft here, we've got the main landing gear. Uh, this is, it's a wheel with a strut. Uh, the cool thing about the 60 overall as a program, uh, the Blackhawk original uh, program was started in 1972. And the Black Hawk was the first Army helicopter, for the U.S. at least, that was designed for crashworthiness. And these landing gear, uh, that's one of the 
design uh, aspects of that to increase the survivability of a crash. So obviously we have struts here, which allow us to land on rough surfaces or uneven terrain to act as like a suspension, but they also absorb a lot of energy if we ever put the aircraft down in a crash. Uh, coming down the right side here, some more. This is a pretty uh, neat little feature right here. This is the kind of stuff that I appreciate uh, that the, all the engineers do for work when they're designing aircraft. Uh, this is a cover for a step. So this is how we get up on top of the aircraft to pre-flight or to do any maintenance work. That's a step that folds out so you can climb up on the tire, climb up on the step, and then get up on top of the engine uh, to do work on, either on the engine or the rotor system or the hydraulics or whatever you want to do up there. Coming down the side of the aircraft here, this is the number two engine. So the original spec for the UH-60 Alphas or the original Blackhawks was the General Electric T-700 series engines. And then in later years, they were upgraded to the T-701 series. Uh, on this aircraft, we have the T-701C, uh, which puts out just under 2,000 shaft horsepower each. Uh, they're a turbo shaft uh, air engine. Uh, so they're very similar to a turboprop, except in instead of spinning a propeller, they go into input modules and then into the main transmission, which we'll talk about a little bit later before being redirected up to the main rotor head and aft to the tail rotor. This is the, obviously the cabin door for the right side of the aircraft. This is where our back enders and our team sits. The, uh, above the door here is our rescue hoist. This is another thing that makes the Air Force Rescue Birds uh, special, if you will, is that generically speaking, if you, a military helicopter shows up, it may or may not have a hoist on it. Uh, but because we do personnel recovery and combat search and rescue, if we can't land or if the survivor's in the water or whatever the reason is we can't land the aircraft, uh, we can send the hoist down. So this hoist has 200 feet of cable on it and is rated for 600 pounds. So generally speaking, that's either two PJs or like once they get on the ground, we can pick up one PJ with the survivor, send the cable back down and pick up the whoever's left on the ground. Uh, this hoist is hydraulically actuated. So when we do use the hoist, it turns our backup hydraulic pump on and that hydraulic pressure is what makes the hoist go up and down. That's also one of the primary duties for the right back ender who sits right here, is not only does, are they responsible for shooting a weapon, but if we ever have to do a hoist, uh, the hoist is on the right side of the aircraft, so that makes sense that the uh, right seat back ender would operate the hoist. This is their controller right here. Uh, they've got this box mounted on the side of the aircraft, and then there's also a pendant right there, so they can hold that pendant in one hand, and normally they'll be on a gunner's belt so they don't fall out of the aircraft, and then they'll be on their knees in the door, and uh, using that pendant in one hand and grabbing the cable with the other hand to make sure that that hoist gets safely into the aircraft. Uh, it's not as simple as just lifting it straight up, especially at high hovers. There's obstacles that they could get tangled on, or they, if there's like a stokes litter, which is a large, uh, essentially a, a patient who's laying down, uh, those can spin, especially with the, uh, the rotor downwash. And so it's a really tough job uh, in certain situations for the back end, you're getting a nice, solid, safe hoist. Uh, but they get a lot of practice at it and they're very, very good at it. This bar right here was added for the hoist. Um, and this bar is just to protect that hoist cable. It's just, it's kind of like a, a Nerf bar on an old uh, pickup truck. But uh, if that hoist cable ever gets swinging a lot, it could potentially hit the bottom of this door here and get cut. So this, this bar is just to protect that hoist cable from accidentally getting sheared if someone's being lifted up with the hoist cable. These two large black objects back here are our internally mounted auxiliary fuel tanks. So these about double our range. Uh, they're 185 gallons each. And obviously they're secured very, uh, they're strapped down very securely so they don't go anywhere uh, if we're flying around. But again, these are a way that we can extend the range of the helicopter other than that air refueling. Uh, these are tied into the main fuel cells that come with any Blackhawk and they have transfer pumps. So when we fill these up, there's pumps in there that will then pump it into the main tanks and then the aircraft engines will burn them out of the main tanks. The only downfall of that is that if you have transfer pumps that go bad and you have fuel in those tanks, it's now trapped weight because that fuel isn't any good because you can't burn it directly out of the aux tanks. This device right here is the faster open insertion uh, system or fries bar. And uh, this is a telescopic bar that can come out either side of the aircraft. So it slides out to the outside of the main cabin door. And then right here is where we can hook a fast rope. We generally don't use fast ropes for ex extractions, uh, but we can use them for getting PJs or whatever team we are working with into the situation. So like on top of a building, if we can't land or in water, we can fast rope them in. And it's basically just a really big rope uh, in different lengths and they slide down it more or less like a, a fireman's pole. And so we hold the hover, the back end will push the rope out so that it goes all the way to the ground. The PJs will grab it, slide down, and then they can either pull it in. If we're doing training, we don't wanna, we don't wanna jettison them just then, but if they need to, they can release them from up here and the ropes will just fall to the ground and then we'll take off and be out of the way very quickly. Uh, so again, that's, that's not something we would use in every situation, 
but depending on uh, the circumstances, we may want to fast rope in the team uh, to get them on the ground pretty quickly. So we've got... As we move down the side, obviously we've got the exhaust uh, of the number two engine here. This is the legacy HERS system or uh, hover infrared suppression system. And this system is a passive infrared suppression system for the engine. Uh, so when you think of uh, heat seeking, which is not the official term, but IR seeking missiles like man pads, uh, the, the Stinger uh, is a US made one. They lock onto hot components of the aircraft like the uh, aircraft exhaust. And so what this HERS does is it takes in ambient air from the outside and kind of sucks it in. So it mixes with that hot exhaust air and it also baffles it a little bit. And you can see the baffles here so that we're not exposing that really hot en engine exhaust directly to the outside world. Uh, the original spec for the, the UH-60 Alpha, they were basically straight piped, if you want to call them that. They just, the exhaust went straight out and there was just a black kind of half, uh, half circle that uh, the exhaust would come out. And then later years, they developed the HERS uh, as those IR threats uh, proliferated and became more of a factor. Uh, down on the right side here, uh, we've got these uh, little spring-loaded doors here, and these are actually steps to get up on top of the aircraft. And we'll use those a little bit later, um, but a lot of helicopters have these. You just stick your foot in, it's got grip uh, material right here, and you can climb up and then open the uh, engine cowling. And that, that, the cowling's kind of one of those, another one of those cool uh, design aspects I always appreciated. So like we talked about earlier, uh, this is the engine cowling, and it makes a, uh, also a great platform for working or inspecting the engines in the rotor head up here. So uh, we'll use our little spring-loaded steps and we'll just come up here and uh, check out the engine. Back here, this is where the APU lives. If you remember, the exhaust came out on the left side there. The APU is just under this cover here and that allows us to have that uh, backup electrical and hydraulic power. This shroud right here is for a legacy defensive system. This is the ALQ-144. I think the President's helicopter still actually has a similar system, but it looks almost like a disco ball and there's a bunch of glass panels in it and there it gives off uh, infrared energy to create mist distance for uh, heat, seek heat seeking or IR guided missiles. So uh, early in the days, like SA-7s, the first gen man pads, they were pretty susceptible to that kind of jamming. Um, and so having this bad boy up here, turning it on, pretty much was all you needed. Uh, both later systems, they were designed to counteract that. So that's why we don't fly with this anymore. Uh, we've got our, obviously our main rotor head up here. This is a pretty awesome design that Sikorsky came up with. Uh, going back to the uh, air transportability of the UH-60 in general, it kept them at a certain uh, rotor head size. And so our, our rotor diameter is 53 feet, eight inches. And if you notice on the tips of the rotor blades, those are canted about 20 degrees back. And that uh, helps us, uh, gives a little bit more hover performance and uh, a little bit of noise reduction. The original 60 was not designed to have this mast extension here. This is all titanium. It was originally, this basically would have bolted up right down here. The problem with that is that they encountered a lot of vibrations uh, in flight testing when they actually built the helicopter. And so their fix for that was just to extend it. So they gave us this rotor mast extension and then these pick, uh, pitch change rods as well. Uh, the only difference is that when they had to put it in the C-130, what they would do is they'd loosen that up, pick it up, remove the extension and bolt it directly to the swash plate and then it was air transportable. So that added a little too much height to fit in the C-130, but still was an overall a, uh, a good compromise. Uh, this is the, the whole uh, rotor head here is titanium, which is pretty awesome. It's very tough, it's ballistically tolerant, uh, past 23 millimeter. Um, and especially in the 1970s when they started building these, that was a kind of a big deal because titanium wasn't used that much. Uh, we've got these bifiler uh, dampeners here. These are basically just weights on this uh, system that allows them to kind of move around. And so it helps uh, even out the, the vibrations of the helicopter uh, when we're flying around. Our, uh, these dampeners here are these, uh, they're hydraulic dampeners and they allow the blades to lead and lag uh, individually. So the, the 60 rotor head is fully articulated, which means that every rotor blade can lead and lag or move forward and aft and up and down a little bit on its own which gives you a little bit more uh, controllability and maneuverability uh, than uh, some other comparable rotor heads like that of the Huey. Because of the um, fully articulated rotor head, uh, Sikorsky developed an elastomeric bearing uh, inside the rotor head for each blade. And what that did is it greatly reduced the maintenance work uh, because traditional rotor heads had metal bearings and they had to be greased and serviced and eventually they'd wear out. But that elastomeric bearing is essentially a, a large piece of very tough rubber and it allows the blade to move around without uh, 
without needing a ton of maintenance uh, because of it not needing to be serviced all the time. So that was a really good design aspect that they added in. Uh, but because the blades uh, do flap a decent amount, we've got droop stops here, and these are spring-loaded and, and as well as heated. Uh, so if we land and it's hot, or I mean, if it's cold and they're iced up, they'll still come back into place. But as that rotor speeds up and we're starting the aircraft, those droop stops will come out, and, that, and the centrifugal force of the blade spinning will keep them more or less out. And then when we slow the rotor down, those droop stops are spring-loaded to pop back in place so the blades have something to rest on. So we're standing here right now and the blades are more or less horizontal, but if we had the ability to pull that droop stop out, the blade would really sag down to the ground uh, just based on how it's designed. So that's what those droop stops are in there for. Uh, the blade has a titanium spar, which is kind of the heart of the blade, and they're charged with nitrogen. So this BIM indicator allows us to show, to see if there's any kind of a leak in that titanium spar. So if there's ever a crack or something in there where that gas leaks out, that could uh, you know, potentially mean that the spar is weakened, which is not a good thing. Um, and so that BIM would not be gold, it would turn red. And that would uh, let the, whoever's doing the pre-flight know that, hey, this blade is bad, do not fly it. Because the blades are just like wings on an aircraft. You wouldn't fly an aircraft, a fixed wing aircraft with cracks or broken pieces in the wings. Uh, you wouldn't do it with a helicopter either. We have this uh, pin system here that allows us to either completely remove the blades or to fold them back. Like I talked about earlier for the air transportability, they can sling all the blades back and put them over the tail uh, just to decrease the footprint of the aircraft. These wires here, that's for the blade DI system. So again, the blades are heated as well as the droop stops. And so there's, just like the tail rotor, the main blades have uh, bonded surfaces in them that are heated via electrical power, so we can shed that ice. The main difference between that and like the engines is that the engines is an anti-ice, so there's no ice is supposed to build up, versus the blades do allow some buildup before uh, they shed them. And uh, based on how much ice is building up will determine the timing and duration of that, uh, that blade DI system turning on. Uh, the reason that's a big deal, uh, just like airplanes, you don't want ice changing the shape of the airfoil of the wing. Same thing with a helicopter. As that ice builds up, it makes it less efficient, uh, less effective, if you will. And so it's going to increase the torque and cause a lot of vibrations uh, in, the, in the controls and in the helicopter. We have it down here, we have our main module that's uh, also known as the main transmission. Uh, that's a, also a pretty neat piece of designing uh, for, by Sikorsky. It's a three-stage planetary system. These engines spin a little over 2,000 RPM, or sorry, 20,000 RPM. So they're very fast turbine engines. But again, the main rotor only spins at 258 RPM. So you've got to really reduce those gears. And so the engines each go into their own individual input modules and then go into the main transmission where it's geared down to 258 RPM for that main rotor and then also has the output uh, for the tail rotor. The transmission, uh, part of the reason it was, it was so good for its day is that it was mainly completely sealed. If you compared that to like an H3 transmission, it had oil lines all over the place and all these different external pieces versus this transmission is essentially one solid piece of magnesium. And uh, so everything's internal, which helps it ballistically. So you're not, if you're getting shot at, you're not shooting off cooling or lubrication lines, but also just from a maintenance standpoint, uh, it's much easier to service because everything's internal to the transmission versus run all over the place. Uh, this is the main swash plate here. Um, so when we are flying around, uh, for any helicopter controls, not just the 60, when you want to increase uh, altitude, you use the collective, and that means all the blades take a bigger bite out of the air collectively, um, versus with a cyclic, if you want to move forward, as the blades are spinning in the rotor disc, you essentially want that disc to tilt forward, so you push forward on the cyclic, and flight control surfaces up here move to allow those blades to uh, flap differently, or take different bites out of the air, if you will, so that that rotor disc moves forward. If you want to move right, you slide it right, and the blades all adjust so that the rotor disc slides right, or tilts right, and then the aircraft will move to the right. And then lastly, while we're up here, uh, like I said, we've got this GE701 uh, Charlie engines up here, just under 2,000 horsepower. These are awesome engines. They're very powerful, uh, very efficient, and very reliable. They're not that big. It's crazy to think this thing puts out about 2,000 horsepower, but is about the size uh, of you know the engine in my pickup, which puts out about 225 horsepower um, and is diesel. So these are very dense uh, as far as what they can produce for power. We've got the accessory drive here that has different sensors attached to it. Um, this is the inlet particle separator. And so uh, when the air comes into the engine, it's got this blower motor here that uh, it's almost like a turbocharger, except instead of blowing it into the engine, it sucks out any dust and particulates and stuff, and then blows it out the back of the aircraft so it doesn't go into the engine. Uh, some older helicopters, like a, for example, a Huey, you might have uh, 
swirl tubes that act almost as like an air filter, whereas this is more of an active system in that it sucks out all that dust and uh, particulates before it ever gets into the engine. Uh, we've got the hot section here, um, and then again, the accessory drive up here, and then the gas generating session, uh, section under here uh, with our uh, fuel control on top of it. Coming down farther on the tail here, uh, obviously a plug for a grounding wire. This is the uh, transition bay. So the back of the 60 here is all uh, hollow and a normal UH-60 that would be more or less empty. The Pavehawk and over the years adding all these different radios and navigation systems, all these different gadgets onto the aircraft, they needed a place to put them. And so they're in this transition bay. So our data link radios, uh, some of our normal line of sight radios, those are all in this aft transition bay. And we let you in there, but it's just really dark and cramped and it's hot here today. Uh, so it will not be enjoyable. Uh, situation for Eric here shooting the video. Uh, down here is the fuel dumping tube. Uh, because we can carry 4,800 pounds of gas, so more gas in your normal Blackhawk, we also need to be able to get rid of that gas. Uh, normally, helicopters don't have fuel dump systems, um, but the advantage for this is if we're flying at a really heavy gross weight and we lose an engine and we need additional weight off the aircraft, we can dump the gas. Or maybe, we, maybe we're doing a, a mission up on a mountainside and we don't have the power to get up there with 3,000 3, pounds of gas or we have, but we need to get down to 2,000 pounds. We could just burn that gas, but that may take a while. So in the cockpit on the fuel management panel, we can just hit a switch and at 800 pounds per minute, it dumps gas out the air aircraft and then we shut it off. We get down to the gas that we need and we continue on our way uh, going to hopefully save Jack, who is the survivor. Uh, coming down the side of the aircraft here, this is another addition that the Air Force did uh, over the Black Hawk spec. So this is uh, one of our flare buckets, forward firing flares, and I didn't cover it, but we also have them on the, the front main gears, and I'll, I'll talk about those when we get to the other side of the aircraft. These obviously just have a cover on them right now, so they don't get any water or any contaminants in here. And then these aft and up facing ones are chaff. So chaff are little teeny bundles of uh, metal that get dispersed in the rotor head. And so when a radar looks at it, it gets a return off that chaff and it creates what we call a chaff cloud which is a way that we can kind of try to defeat some of those radars that may be trying to track us or shoot us down. So we can dispense that chaff from the cockpit um, and hopefully defeat that radar. So again, these are something that the Air Force added. Uh, we use a little bit different flares than the Army. And so over the years, instead of running with the Army, the two flare buckets on the tail, we went with the four flare buckets, uh, including the two chaff buckets back here. Uh, this is one of our GPS uh, antenna receivers. So the original Pavehawk, or the, actually the original Blackhawk, all it had for a navigation system was a Doppler. So Doppler is decent for judging uh, ground speed and ground track, but it doesn't know where it is in the world. It just gives you that information and you're expected to navigate off of a map. So when the Air Force got its Payfox, they said, we're gonna be flying low level and doing these long range missions. We need a little bit better system. So they paired a Doppler with an INS or an inertial navigation system. And then when GPS uh, was a thing in the 90s, in the early 90s, we had a GPS. So when I started flying the, the Payfox a few years ago, we had a Doppler and an INS and a GPS, and those all kind of talked to each other to come up with a good navigation solution. Uh, in later years, we've had it, we've replaced those with dual EGIs or embedded GPS INS. So there's two INSs with their own GPS receivers. And then that's what this addition for is that antenna uh, for that uh, GPS, for one of the GPS receivers. Those are really accurate navigation systems. They're really uh, resistant to GPS jamming. And then worst case, if we do get GPS jam, we have dual INSs to let us continue on the mission until we get somewhere where there's less GPS jamming. Uh, coming down uh, right here, we just got a tie down strap. So when we land on ships and that kind of stuff, uh, we wanna have different tie downs. Um, and this is one of the options that we have uh, for tying the aircraft down. Coming down to the side of the aircraft, we've got the VOR uh, antennas here. These are a blade style antenna uh, for the VOR. This is the cover for the tail rotor drive shaft and the releases for it are on the other side. But like I said earlier, the engines transmit their power into the main module and then eventually comes down the tail rotor drive shaft to the intermediate gearbox and then up until the tail rotor gearbox, which we'll cover in a little bit. These holes here, um, these are actually for a bracket that allows us to store the, wing, the rotor blades when they're folded. So the, the bl basic Blackhawk, when they designed it, one of the requirements that the Army had is that it had to be uh, not only be able to fit in a C-130, which was fairly challenging design aspect to begin with, but it also had to be able to be uh, either disassembled or reassembled at wherever location they were going to relatively quickly. And so the Army set timelines and said, hey, you only have maybe, I think it was like 30 minutes from when it's rolling out to, to roll it off the aircraft. Uh, traditional aircraft from the 60s, uh, a lot of them, especially larger aircraft like Chinooks or CH-53s, you have to remove the rotor head, you might have to remove the transition transmission. And so there's a lot of maintenance actions that need to happen before you move them and after, which makes it a pain when you're trying to rapidly deploy to let's say a, 
uh, a natural disaster that then need to bring all these maintainers and a crane and everything to set the aircraft back up. So all that to say, they designed rapid mobility uh, via strategic airlift into the Black Hawk, including the Pave Hawk. And so there's these brackets. When we fold the rotor blades back, they all fold back towards the tail. And so there's four rotor blades more or less in line with the tail. And there's brackets here that go into these different holes on both sides of the tail here to hold those rotor blades in place so they're not bouncing around when we're loading it or flying it in the back of, uh, for example, a C-17. I personally have never seen uh, an Air Force Payfock flown in a C-130, mainly because it would probably also remove taking the FLIR and the probe off the front, uh, which is just additional work. Uh, we like our C-17s because we can slam two of them in there. Coming down here, we've got the tail wheel. Uh, again, this was a design factor that Sikorsky built in for crash worthiness and just because it works. Um, when you're flying at extremely high nose uh, up pitch attitudes, that tail will act almost like a tail stinger. You know, if you see ever like on a Huey or a CH-53, they have a, a, essentially a piece of metal, looks almost like a barb that will catch the tail and hopefully not allow the tail to hit the ground. That's not required in a 60 because you've got your tail wheel here uh, that will absorb any impact. It does have a strut in there and then the tail wheel steering itself is actually just pilot operated. So you can't really see it on this side, but we'll look on the other side. Uh, there's a switch inside and we just unlock the tail wheel pin. So when we want to turn, we unlock the tail wheel pin, it'll say it's unlocked. And then we just use uh, the rotor or the tail rotor with our pedals to move where we want to go. And then we're ready for takeoff and we're all lined up. Press the button again, the pin goes back in, tail wheel's locked and you're good to go. And as far as I know, other than the, uh, some of the, the Navy's Romeo uh, 60s that had the tail wheel up here, I think every 60 variant has essentially the same system. Uh, the Navy did a little bit different stuff because uh, they were landing on small decks on ships. Uh, so coming down to the tail here, we've got a couple different things that are noteworthy on the 60. Um, like I said, talking about that rapid mobility, uh, these bolts here are actually a hinge system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we want to transport this in an airplane, in theory, like a C5, you could probably just put it in as it is, but it would take up additional space. Or like when the Navy is on a ship, every square foot counts for something. And so what we can do is the stabilator folds up, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Well, they'll fold the uh, tail rotor paddles as well and the blades, and then this whole tail section pivots on these hinges and swings this way. So it shortens the aircraft significantly and allows us a little bit uh, more space when we're loading it in an airplane, especially like a C-130. And again, that was one of the design characteristics that Sikorsky built into this in the 70s when they were designing it, is that it had to fit in that Herc, but it still had to be so long that uh, you, know, you could fly, the, fly it. And so they came up with this folding tail. Another cool feature, like I talked about with the step down there, are, are these steps that are out for the tail, uh, the tail rotor. So we've got this folding step here, and then on both sides of the tail boom, there are uh, these pop-out steps, and these just push in via spring pressure, and then lock in place with like a quarter turn. So then when you wanna walk up the tail, uh, for example, you're pre-flighting the, uh, the tail rotor, or you need to change the, the bulb on the strobe light or something like that up there, you can just straddle this. It's almost uh, like riding a horse. You put the tail uh, boom between your legs and crawl up on the ladder. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a cool little thing. Uh, I always appreciated that Sikorsky designed uh, into the, the 60s. You gotta be able to get up there somewhere and instead of bringing a step ladder, you just bring your own ladder with you. Coming around the right side of the aircraft here, we've got the stabilator. So this stabilator is actually in the, more or less the level position. Uh, normally it's gonna be full down for parking purposes. Again, going back to the design characteristics of the Black Hawk, which again, the Pave Hawk is a variant of the Army had to fit it inside of a C-130, but it's the cabin still had to be so large, it still had to have so much climb performance, top speed performance, et cetera. So the, the Army set pretty big uh, requirements for these the helicopter designers to design one of these bad boys. And so the Sikorsky engineers, uh, in my opinion, had a really good idea, because as far as I know, this was the first time they did it. But if you come around the side of the aircraft, you'll notice that the tail rotor is canted 20 degrees to the left there. So it's got that canted tail rotor, and as far as I know, every 60 ever has had that uh, feature. But what that does is it allows the tail rotor to not only provide anti-torque to oppose the spinning blades, but it also gives us some lift. And so that's only about 400 pounds of lift from that tail rotor, but actuating all the way back here with the rotor head more or less as a fulcrum as a lever, it provides a lot of lift and allows the aircraft to control its pitch. And I don't know if you just heard it, but there's this A-10 shoot in the background, so that's awesome. Um, but anyways, the tail rotor, again, provides lift and not, all, and not just anti-torque thrust. So the reason that's a big deal is because it allowed Sikorsky to shift the center of gravity or the CG from under the rotor head 
aft. So it came back towards the, towards the tail a little bit more and that allowed them to then shorten the cockpit and the gunner's area in front of the main rotor head to keep the aircraft length at its overall uh, you know, size while still make, making sure that they had enough space in the uh, c cabin for the, I think it was 11 combat troops is what the Army's requirement was. They had to fill like 11 combat troops. Um, and so anyways, that canted tail rotor, because it provides some lift, it gives some directional control uh, off the nose and again, allowed that CG to shift rearward. The only problem with that, we'll talk about a little bit later with the flight controls, is that when you apply left pedal and you're increasing the pitch on the blade, it's actually gonna create anti-torque and move the nose left, but it's also gonna lift the tail. And then conversely, if you put in right pedal, it would drop the tail because you're adjusting lift on the tail itself. So I'll talk about that with the flight controls a little bit later. Uh, so of course, again, they, they didn't uh, overlook this one and they designed uh, a system to counteract that. But uh, going back to the stabilator, the reason that the stabilator isn't just a fixed aileron or a, a fixed airfoil like any other aircraft or helicopters is that of, because of this canted tail rotor. In a hover like this uh, with the, the stabilator more or less level, a lot of that downwash from the lift being created uh, on the, from the tail rotor would push the nose up. And it becomes, it's not dangerous, but it's not really comfortable when you're uh, piled up front and all you're basically looking at is sky because your nose is way up in the air because the tail is pushing down on a flat stabilator. And Sikorsky went through a couple different design iterations when they were designing this. Uh, they wanted fixed uh, airfoils, but they just couldn't come up with anything that worked. And so what they developed was this electrically uh, actuated stabilator. So there's two, electrically, uh, there's two electrical um, actuators built into the tail here that work together and they run off of airspeed. So like I said, this, this stabilator normally on, a gr on the ground would be full down like that aircraft over there because once we get through about 40 knots, the, air, the sensors, the airspeed sensors program the stabilator down. And so that way when you're in a hover, the stabilator's down and most of that lift that's coming off the tail rotor washes off of it, almost like water going down a hill and allows you to have a more or less uh, normal hover attitude, about two to three degrees nose high. But then once you take off, obviously you don't want the stabilator creating all sorts of drag. So as you build some airspeed, it starts programming up until when we're in flight, it's more or less level um, to give us kind of the best of both worlds. It gives us a decent hover attitude picture uh, when we're hovering or in slow, low speed flight. But then when we're flying around, it still uh, stabilizes the aircraft, keeps the nose from wallowing around, keeps us from slide slipping a lot. Um, and so it's a really good system uh, that was designed. Again, I think every 60 has some version of the stabilator built into it. Uh, one of the, the initial spec for the UH-60 Alpha had one, st one solid stabilator. Um, and so when the Air Force got their PAVEHAWK, uh, I, I don't know if they did it first or the Navy did it first, but they came up with a folding stabilator. So if you look at the stabe here, there's hinges right here. And obviously we don't want it to fold in flight, but again, talking about the air transportability, uh, these, both of these stabilator wings fold up with the tail and then it swings all the way around so that you, can, you don't have this solid stabilator that you need to take off. And as far as I know, the Army, at least with their mic models, has since transitioned to a folding stabilator just because it is uh, kind of the, the standard at this point. Uh, these are just some static uh, discharge whips that we have here. Uh, most aircraft have those, especially on the wings. Uh, we can't really put them on our wings because they're rotor blades and they spin around really fast. Uh, so we have them here on the stabilator. Looking at the tail rotor really quick, that's another kind of a unique design feature that Sikorsky built in uh, when they designed the aircraft. Traditionally, all of your uh, main and tail rotors had metal bearings that they would spin on. But if you look at that, there's a very, uh, there's basically no bearings up there because instead of having four rotor blades that each pivot individually, there are two graphite uh, paddles that we call them that interlock there. So uh, obviously the red and the yellow one are one piece and then the black and the blue one are another. Um, and those don't pivot on a bearing, they just flex. So as we apply more left left pedal and increase or decrease the pitch on the rotor, the tail rotor, those blades just flex uh, as they're, uh, as they essentially sit in place. So again, they're not spinning on bearings, they're just, uh, they flex. You might ask, why are there red, yellow, blue, and black blades? Uh, we have them on the main rotor blades as well, and that's actually for maintenance purposes. Uh, it's a little bit more important for the main rotor head, but we do what's called a track and balance. And we wanna make sure the blades more or less all weigh the same so that they spin nicely, kind of like balancing the tires on your car. You don't wanna have them out of balance because it'll give you a really rough ride. And then also the track, uh, they can adjust the, the pitch change links to make sure each blade spins through the air more or less in the same circle and when you're in a if you get enough time in the 60 and you get a blade that's out of track uh, you'll notice it because it'll vibrate and you'll be sitting on the ground and you'll see one rotor blade kind of dip into the uh, dip in or out of the tip path plane compared to the rest of them so anyways that's why they're different color coded you can't really tell when they're spinning but that allows maintenance uh, they can put it into their computer when they shoot the blades 
and when it spits out the data, it'll say like, hey, add weight to the red blade or uh, you know, take weight from the yellow blade, whatever. So that's how maintenance uh, identifies the, uh, the rotor blades. The wires that are coming out of the tear rotor gearbox up there, those are for the blade de-ice. Uh, so I didn't talk about that earlier, but the, the main rotor blades and the tear rotor blades both have a, a blade de-ice feature. And there's electrically heated panels that are bonded into the blade surface itself. And so when we turn that system on, it, can, it tries to sense how much ice is on those rotor blades. And as it builds up, it will turn those heat panels on to shed that ice uh, so we can fly in a more or less normal flight regime. At the back of the tail here, we've got more uh, missile warning sensors up here. Uh, they're basically the same ones on the front of the aircraft and then more RWR antennas back here for a, a total of four each. The uh, tail rotor spins at just under 1200 RPM and so that's significantly faster than the million rotor which spins at about 258 RPM. Uh, so not as quite as fast as you would think uh, but generally speaking for the size of them tail rotors seem to make more noise on helicopters and uh, the main rotor just because they're spinning so much faster. So when you ever hear a helicopter fly over and hear that more of a buzzing sound like an airplane prop it's most likely coming off of that tail rotor there. Uh, going to the uh, left side of the stabilator here, we have these on both sides. We call these slime lights, uh, but they're officially called formation lights. And so we've got one on either side of the stabilator and then uh, two up here on the spine of the aircraft on the tail rotor uh, drive shaft cover. And these are a green light. Uh, we can see them under NVGs or with the naked eye and they're adjustable intensity, but we use these for flying formation. Uh, so on a dark night, if we're fairly far away from our wingman, let's say we're you know half a mile away or something, we can line up the different slime lights and judge aspect uh, on that wingman with those. And additionally, these two little dimples right here, these are IR versions, so we can completely black out the helicopter and use infrared lighting only. It's these guys right here. And so that way, if someone's out there, as long as they don't have night vision goggles or MVGs, they can't see us, uh, which is pretty sweet. In the 80s and early 90s, that was a really big deal because most militaries didn't have MVGs, but now today with like your iPhone 12 or whatever, it basically has an MVG on it. Um, so it makes it a little bit harder, um, but it's still very effective for flying, uh, flying blacked out. Coming down the left side of the aircraft here, this is the intermediate gearbox. So again, that tail rotor uh, drive shaft has multiple sections and it comes out of the back of the main transmission. And then this changes direction to send it up the tail before its final gear reduction uh, in the tail rotor gearbox up there uh, for the tail rotor. Just under like 1190 RPM, I think is what the, the RPM is on that. But we can't measure that. We just want to keep our rotor spinning at 100%. Coming down the left side of the aircraft, we've got some more of these holes uh, for the brackets like I talked about with folding the main rotor blades. We've got the other VOR antenna here. Uh, this is one of our SATCOM slash line of sight radio antennas. Uh, so we call these the egg beaters, but there's one here and then there's another one further up on, the, uh, on top of the, uh, right near the APU. And those allow us to speak not only to various agencies on VHF or UHF radios, but also uh, with UHF SATCOM. So if we're doing long range stuff, uh, we can have connectivity with someone. And that's one thing that you'll notice different about this 60 than say like a, an Army UH-60 is the original Payfox did have, it looked like a big rail that ran down the side here. That was a high frequency or an HF antenna. And that's kind of, it's low tech, but it still works really well. And it bounces radio waves off the atmosphere and you can go super long uh, range. So before SATCOM uh, was really widely proliferated, that was kind of the standard. Um, and the, like I said, the Army still uses it because it works really well. Um, but we in the Air Force have since gone away from that, uh, mainly because no one else in the Air Force really uses F or, uh, HF as far as I know. Uh, coming down here, we just got a cooling uh, outlet for some of the uh, avionics in the aft transition bay there. Another chaff dispenser dispenser with a flare dispenser here. Uh, the chaff's actually kind of cool because the chaff bundles are double loaded. So a single stick actually holds two chaff bundles, which allows us to effectively double how much chaff we can hold. Unfortunately, with our spinning rotor head, uh, helicopters in general are not uh, exactly stealth, if you will, or low observable because you always have uh, either closing or opening velocity in the rotor head. Um, but it does, like I said, help us defeat those radars. If they lock us up, we can send some chaff out and maybe dive behind terrain before they, they get a missile shot off at us. I got another tie down here. Uh, this is the <clears throat> engine or the exhaust for the APU or auxiliary power unit. Um, so that is a, uh, runs off the, the fuel system, uh, just like the main engines do. And we can start the APU. It allows us to put electrical power on the aircraft. The APU spins a generator uh, that allows us to uh, run up avionics and that kind of stuff without spinning the main rotors. And then that generator can then be used to power the backup hydraulic pump. So the 60 has fully redundant hydraulic systems. There's a number one and a number two system. And then there's a backup pump that is essentially the same pump, but it, instead of running off of the transmission, it runs off an electric motor. And so that allows us to check out the flight controls and use it uh, and for this, the, the 
Payfox specifically, because that hoist is, is hydraulically driven, it also allows the back enders to check out the hoist before the aircraft is actually running, because we obviously want to make sure that thing is safe if we're going to send any PJs down it or pick up any survivors. Coming down the left side of the aircraft here, we've got our um, fueling panel here, so <clears throat> we've got our different connections for refueling. We normally use the larger one on the left, uh, but the Army does have a uh, kind of an open loop system uh, that they can use. Uh, that's more of a legacy uh, s functionality that we don't really use on the Air Force bases, but this allows us to ground refuel the aircraft. And they also have a pneumatic ground star here. Uh, I personally have never used this, but uh, this allows us to start the engines with another helicopter uh, using a buddy start system that's essentially a large hose uh, because the 60 engines are started pneumatically. And so in a normal engine starting sequence, it's actually got a couple uh, interesting things. The APU is started uh, hydraulically. So there's two hydraulic accumulators. It's basically a pressurized tank with hydraulic fluid. And when we turn the APU on, that hydraulic fluid is discharged out of those accumulators and starts the APU, which is the exhaust right here. Once that APU is up and running, then when we want to start the engines, we hit the start switches and it takes some of that bleed air off of the APU. So the hot air that's going through the APU, it sucks some of that out and uses it to spin the starter for the engines. And that's what allows us to motor the engines until they're self-sustaining and then they're, then they're running. Um, but for whatever reason, maybe your APU, you're in the middle of nowhere and your APU got shot out and you need to be able to start the helicopter. You have your buddy show up with his Blackhawk and he lands next to you and he hooks up the buddy start system here and he can use his pneumatic power from his engines to then spin your engines and start them up. Like I said, I've never used that. That's like a kind of a contingency situation, but it is great that we have this because otherwise, if you can't spin the motors and you can't start them and now you're, you've got a very expensive hunk of aluminum uh, sitting uh, on the ground in bad guy territory. Obviously, this is the number one engine with the HERS system here like we talked about earlier. We've got the main cabin door here with, again, uh, my favorite spring-loaded steps uh, coming down the side of the aircraft. And then we've got the, uh, the left side of the cabin, which is a little bit uh, cleaner than the right side, mainly because we don't have the hoist there. So we don't have the hoist controller, which is across the uh, cabin over there. We've still got our two uh, back under seats or gunner seats. There's also these uh, consoles. So traditionally, the Air Force, the aviator sitting in the left seat was a gunner, and on the right seat was a flight engineer, or FE. And they called these the gunners and FE's consoles. If you notice, the back aft console on the the cockpit is very large where that, that the first aid kit is. That's not original to the Blackhawk. As the Air Force started adding a FLIR and multiple radios and navigation systems and defense systems and all this different stuff to the, the original Blackhawk, they needed a place to put all those switches and all that gear. So they started extending the aft console. But we eventually, essentially ran out of dash space on the instrument panel and on the center console. So they started moving stuff to the back, uh, including on these consoles here. So the, the gunner and the FE, uh, can, for example, they can run the, the blade DI system because that wasn't required to be up front. And then they have their intercom and uh, different control panels back here for the, the systems that they're running. So again, that's kind of a, when I talk about the whiskey a little bit later, that helped us clean up the back of the aircraft by condensing some of our avionics. We got the same fold out step here on the left side with the tie down. Uh, we used to have lights mounted right here, but they were incandescent and they weren't, we couldn't make them covert or IR. So they were a real pain flying at night. I personally never flew with them, but that's kind of a legacy uh, installation. And uh, so they blocked those off and now we just have the IR, a uh, little uh, lights right there that do the same function without blinding out your goggles. This is the Gao 2 minigun. This is the, uh, was the flavor of choice for our guns for many years up until about 15 years ago or so. Uh, this is a Gatling gun that shoots uh, either 2,000 or 4,000 rounds a minute, depending on which button the uh, back ender shoots back here. It shoots a 7.62 millimeter uh, bullet, so that kind of that NATO standard. And this ammunition handling system is more or less the same as with the 50 cal on the other side of the aircraft, except that it holds a lot more ammunition. Uh, whereas the 50 cal can has 600 rounds, uh, this one can hold 2,700 rounds because that 7.62 is just so much smaller. Uh, so that allows us, allows us to carry about 5,400 rounds of minigun ammo on a single PAVOC, which is pretty cool uh, when they're, especially at night with tracers. Uh, these things, is, low rate looks good, but high rate looks really good because it's basically a laser it's shooting, again, 4,000 rounds a minute um, with a, a tracer mixed in there every now and then. Um, and even then, it's just like a red uh, laser going down to the target. This has a little bit less hitting power than a 50 cal and also a little bit less range, but it's really good for like collateral damage. If you're shooting at uh, targets that are fairly close to your aircraft and you don't want to worry, you don't want to worry about those bullets going off and 
hitting innocent people or something, that's where the minigun's really good. Uh, not terribly good against armor, but like a small vehicle, a light-skinned vehicle, or a person on the ground, uh, the minigun's going to be pretty good for cleaning that up. This is for the spent ammunition. So when they shoot, when you got 4,000 rounds uh, a minute of brass coming out, it's gonna come out this hose and then fall just on the ground. And the 50 gal has a similar system. It just sticks out a little bit more on the minigun here. Otherwise, it would just kind of shoot out like a, a chainsaw shoots out uh, sawdust when you're, you're cutting. And then this, this black thing right here is the motor. So this is what spins uh, the barrels here uh, to get that high rate of fire. This is the link, the ammo link. So this is how the ammunition comes out of the uh, the handling unit, there's electric motors in there with little cog wheels on them and it feeds it out and it comes up this link, shoots out of the gun and then the brass comes down this tube. Looking at the landing gear here really quick, uh, it's kind of hard to see because of the flare bucket, but this is part of the WISPIS or wire strike protection system. So this right here is a cutter for cables. So if you're flying around low level or even not so low level and you maybe run into a set of power lines or something and you hit them, uh, that system is designed to deflect the cable uh, if it's on the nose of the aircraft, underneath the aircraft, and one of those cutters, in theory, should cut it so that it doesn't snag on the aircraft and bring your helicopter down. So that's part of the WISPIS system. Um, coming down towards the co-pilot side, this little blade right here, that's also part of the WISPIS, and that just helps guide that cable uh, into the cutter. Obviously, we've got the left uh, seat here, and then the navigation light right here um, for uh, flying around at night, uh, making sure you're visible. Uh, we've got the other pitot-static system up here, the pitot tube, uh, right over the co-pilot seat. Coming around the nose of the aircraft here, another kind of special thing about the, the PAYFOC is its color weather radar. So that's what's behind this radome right here. It's a APN 239 color weather radar. It's good, uh, in theory, it's good for about 240 nautical miles of range, which at normal cruise speed is about two hours ahead of you. So that's, that's quite, uh, quite a ways out. Um, it's, it's not the greatest radar that's out there anymore, but it still works pretty well, especially down here in South Georgia when we're trying to dodge uh, thunderstorms. Let's say if we go out to the Gulf to do some water operations and then we're coming home and we're trying to pick our way around uh, thunder cells, we can use the radar to find that information or where those storms are. Again, missile warning system or sensor up here with another, another RWR antenna. This is another part of our wire strike protection system or WISPIS. These little veins here help guide cables up over the windshield wiper so they don't get caught. And then eventually it will either get cut by the cutter that's right over uh, the windscreens there or up higher up that gray object that's sticking up that helps funnel it down into the uh, blade on the, the very top side so the cable doesn't get caught around the main rotor head. One of the last things that kind of made the, the PayFox special and still does a certain amount to this day is the sensor up front. This is an AAQ-29 FLIR or forward-looking infrared. And this uh, was really important, especially in the, the 80s and 90s when uh, and night vision goggles, NVGs just weren't that good. The FLIR works in a different wavelength than NVGs. And so at certain times of night, like at dawn or dusk, uh, during thermal crossover, when the, the earth is more or less all the same color, NVGs don't always work that great. And so the FLIR was a great way to back that up and give you, it looks at a little bit different bandwidth of light. Of light. And so, um, the, again, it just supplemented the NVGs when flying at night or a low level. Uh, today we still use it for that, specifically for picking out like terrain or trees or power lines or anything that may be in the flight path. And then our hover cues, uh, which display in the cockpit, are actually overlaid on top of that picture. So as we're coming into an LZ in a dark night, it will point at the LZ and then we can see airspeed and uh, inst instantaneous vertical velocity and that kind of stuff while we're looking at the picture, which is a pretty handy uh, function uh, that the FLIR uh, combines with our uh, sim symbology in the helicopter. Uh, lastly, this is the nose of the aircraft, obviously. Um, there's two latches here, and then there's this uh, cooling uh, grid up here, just allows air to flow in and out. We've got a bunch of radios and stuff mounted in the nose. Uh, it's mainly just uh, older technology that we've since upgraded uh, to more modern radios. Uh, but that's what's under the nose compartment uh, of the PAYFOC. And with that, we can uh, climb in the cabin and start looking at what the, the pilots see up front. This is one of the additions that we've added uh, fairly recently to the PAYFOC. This is our small, smart multifunction color display, or SMFCD. Traditionally, we had a screen here that showed us what our FLIR was looking at. That was more or less it, and it had some hover cues and some other stuff on there. Uh, but with increased technology or more advancement of technology, we've been able to add a lot of functionality into this display. This is actually a color or a touchscreen display. And uh, again, still shows our FLIR image with our hover cues, but it also has a moving map in the background that we can zoom in and out. We can also pull up imagery if we're trying to land 
uh, at a site that we've never been to before. We can zoom into like one meter imagery. Um, it also interfaces with our situational awareness data link or saddle. Uh, we use a data link that talks uh, to HC-130s and A-10s as well as, as well as some ground players. And that saddle allows us to see where they are in space and time uh, over the moving map. Additionally, we can use saddle to message them. Uh, so if we have, for example, the location of a, of a survivor, they can say it over the radio and we have to write it down or they can just send it to us in a message and it will just pop up on our screen, which is pretty nice. Um, the Smart MFCD is also the way we integrate with our LARS radio, which is a lightweight airborne recovery system. That's a special UHF radio designed to find and message survival radios on the ground. Uh, traditionally, we had the controller for it here, and then we had a display here, and we could ping the radio, if you will, and find out where it was and get distance and range and, uh, range and bearing on that radio. Um, but with the Smarto FCD, these are actually redundant now. So the radio control head here is just an on-off switch. And we can get all that information plus some more uh, on the Smarto FCD. And one of the cool things we can do is message, essentially text message the radio back and forth. So we can say, hey, are you injured? Or are there any, any enemy nearby? That kind of stuff. And there's just a keyboard that pops up on the bottom of the screen and we just uh, type it out. And that allows the survivor to essentially communicate with us without giving away their position by talking on the radio and uh, creating noise. So Smart MCD is a really a nice addition that we've gotten in the last few years. Um, up here, we've just got the radar altimeter uh, with aerospin indicator, uh, our attitude indicator. It's got obviously some nav flags because uh, nothing is turned on up here, as well as our uh, uh, HSI uh, for flying instruments because we are uh, instrument rated pilots. We have our DME or distance measuring equipment readout for our TACAN. Uh, so when we're either flying formation and we're using a TACAN for distance or we're flying instruments, uh, that's where it'll show up here. We have different mode select panels uh, for the instruments. So for example, if we want to do a VOR or an ILS, um, we can adjust some, we can change to some of the gyros. So maybe if my vertical gyro starts going out of whack, I can uh, go to the alternate vertical gyro. Uh, most of this stuff is pretty standard for uh, UH-60 Alpha Limas. Uh, very important piece right here, that's a clock, um, but it's pretty old school. You still need to wind it up. Uh, so every once in a while they get in and you're like, oh man, it's still 10 o'clock. And nope, it's not 10 o'clock, it's noon. It's just, you forgot to wind the clock. Uh, we've got vertical speed here. So this is obviously off the, the barometric system. Um, so it's uh, using uh, air pressure as we uh, climb and descend, as well as an altimeter here. This is our RWR scope, our radar warning receiver. So I talked about those antennas on the nose and tail. When we get painted with that radar, it will talk to us on our headset. It's this really weird robot voice. And then it will also display symbols up here telling you where it's from um, and what type, of, what type of system it is. This was really dope technology in the in 1970s when it came out. Um, we kind of take it for granted, but this is a vid or visual identification strip. And all these are little different colored lights that move up and down, kind of like, like high tech stereos in the 1980s. You see all the different equalizer bars moving up and down. That's what this is. Um, so they're normally uh, either te pressure or temperature, um, but like RPM, we've got a rotor RPM in the middle here, that's speed. Um, and it'll be red or green or amber if it's in a transition zone, uh, depending on the what it's reading out. So this is our torque uh, here. So we've got number one and number two, and that's essentially how much power we're applying on the aircraft. And then we've got our uh, NF, so our uh, power turbines here with rotor uh, speed in the middle. And so this is what the pilot's primarily looking at. And then we also have additional vids up here uh, for fuel quantity, transmission temperature and pressure for the oil in there, uh, engine oil temp for both engines, engine press for the oil, both engines. Uh, TGT, which is turbine gas temperature, that's a really big thing that we're looking at in high and hot altitudes uh, because we can, the temp the engines can only burn so hot and they will limit themselves and then you'll start running out of power and subsequently decaying your rotor speed. And then lastly, NG, which is that gas generating turbine. So those, again, that's just showing you the overall health of the engine. Obviously, if you start losing engine oil pressure on one of your engines, you're looking to land and maybe shut that engine down so you don't uh, do any damage to it. This display here is for the color weather radar up front. Um, it show you when you turn it on, you'll see the sweep for the uh, radar as it moves across the sky with different modes. <clears throat> for example, nav mode, I can turn that on, and my flight plan that's built in the system will then be overlaid on the radar return. Uh, which, for us, it doesn't sound like a big deal when you can look on your iPhone and get weather for anywhere in the world. But in the 1990s, uh, that's it's, it was a pretty nice feature, and it still is a nice feature because you can see. Okay, I, I can see there's a thunderstorm 30 miles away but then you can see your route goes 10 miles away from that and you're, you say, okay, good, we're clear from that. Uh, this little cursor here, um, that moves a cursor on the screen. So if you wanna plot coordinates for a weather cell or sometimes we'll use the radar to find ships out at sea and we, cause the sea, ocean is more or less flat 
And so we can paint the surface of the ocean with the radar, and when we get a return, that may or may not be the ship. But what we can do is we can use this little joystick here and slew the cursor over to the spot, the return on the scope, and then store it as a waypoint and enter it into the navigation system. So instead of just trying to fly off with this radar return, which may get kind of fuzzy or something, or maybe the radar fails, I don't know, uh, you now have coordinates that you can fly to. And it's not gonna be super accurate, but it'll get you close enough where you can then see the ship on your own uh, with your the Mark One eyeball. This is the stabilator uh, position indicator. Um, again, that slews up and down manually, but if you have some kind of a situation where it, it breaks, you've got uh, different positions where it is, so it's full down now and it'll slew all the way up. And then uh, airspeed indications there, or airspeed limits, if you will, for uh, the stabilator. So for example, if it's full down at 40 degrees, you're limited to 45 knots. And at that point, you're basically gonna be staring at the ground uh, because the stabilator is, is pushing the nose down as the air flows over it. This is our uh, fuel quantity indicator uh, right here with uh, this mainly this switch that works with it. Uh, the, because we have the aux tanks in the back, we need the ability to see not only what's in the, the factory tanks, if you will, the stock tanks, but also what's in the uh, auxiliary tanks. So this is our readout that we get for that to let us know how much gas we have total. And then there's a switch here that we can hit and it will, instead of showing, showing the total fuel, it'll show just what's in the aux tanks. This is our uh, AAR-47, that's the missile warning system. So those sensors we had on the nose and tail of the aircraft, that's what uh, it will display as if we get missile uh, launches at us. And it, all, it can also do laser warning. Uh, so certain weapon systems like anti-tank guided missiles, uh, they're probably not gonna use that against like a fast flying aircraft, but would uh, not be a terrible option for like a hovering helicopter. They could shoot like a, a missile uh, normally used for tanks. Um, but normally those are laser guided. So if you get laser warning, that's probably what someone's doing. It's shooting like a, an anti-tank guided missile or maybe a laser range finder so then they can then uh, start zeroing in on, and shooting you. So again, missile warning, but also a laser warning for those threats. And then when it wants to dispense flares or chaff, uh, we'll get this light up here that will say, yes, I'm ready, I'm armed, good to go. And uh, or sorry, get the armed light, and then when it's ready, uh, if we don't have it in auto dispense, it will give you that light to say, hey, I'm ready to dispense chaff uh, or flare uh, as the situation dictates. This is our caution advisory panel. So it's just a bunch of idiot lights. Um, they'll say, they'll tell you if you've got a chip light in your engine or your transmission or your tail rotor. Um, they'll tell you if, and then some advisories as well. So like, hey, your engine anti-ice is on, uh, your landing lights on, all that kind of stuff, your backup pumps on. So most of them are amber because they're cautions uh, letting you know that something's wrong with the aircraft. And then the bottom ones are green that just lets you know, hey, like you're flying around in combat and your landing lights on, that's probably not a good idea because you're gonna get shot at. So it'll, it'll uh, poke you in the eyeball up there to let you know. And then obviously on the cope outside, it's more or less a mirror image of what the pilot's got uh, without like the RWR scope um, up there. Down on the center uh, console here, we've got the APHIS panel or automatic flight control system panel. That's pretty standard for 60s. Um, we've got different flight control uh, functions, so our boost for uh, flight controls as well as our SASs, so stability augmentation systems, just help the aircraft fly nice and uh, straight and level and smooth. A trim, which helps keeps our sticks uh, stick in place. Our, uh, we have collective trim on this as well. So we can uh, set the cyclic to where we want it with trim or set the collective to where we want it and it will hold it there. And then uh, flight path stability or stabilization. <laughs> that again just gives us a nice smooth ride because uh, helicopters generally kind of bounce around because they don't they, they don't like to fly. It's a little bit of black magic involved with there. And then when we need to use a stabilator as well, uh, this is how we can manually slew it. Uh, so uh, for example, if we have a situation where it kicks off, we can reset it and then manually control it if we need to. These CDUs are how we interface with the navigation system on the aircraft. So we can load flight plans on there. We can calculate range and bearing from, for example, our point to another location. Um, we can calculate fuels. We can calculate hover power. So if we're gonna go land on a mountain, we can say, we can plot it on the map and say, okay, it's at 8,069 feet. Uh, it's probably about 15 degrees up there. We can calculate the power on the box and let us know how much we need to hover and if we need to uh, dump gas like we talked about earlier or lighten the aircraft somehow. Uh, this is how we used to interface with saddle, so that's one of the reasons the Smart CD is so nice, is because you can go and adjust all your settings uh, in there. And then one of the another special thing we have uh, on the Payfot is it's a CIB receiver, a common interactive broadcast, and we have a radio antenna that uh, is constantly receiving uh, this intelligence feed from assets uh, in outer space uh, via that uh, essentially SATCOM satellite communications. And so if we have a survivor pop up anywhere in theater or a radar threat pops up and an intelligence platform picks it up, we almost instantly will get notification of that on our CDU, which is amazing 
because we may be the first people to know that a survivor is out there or that there's a threat that is now a big factor. You know, our mobile, uh, especially mobile SAM systems, like a, for example, an SA-15, they're, they're mobile, so no one, a lot of times, don't really know exactly where they are. So when that guy turns on his radar, comes through the intelligence feed, we can say, boom, there's his coordinates, he's right there. And so we can let our, we'll know, and then everyone else will know as well that we're talking to that, hey, there's there's a threat out there. So that's that's a pretty nice uh, feature we have on the on the PayFoc here. This is the uh, controller for the, the FLIR up front. And so we've just got a force controller here to move it left and right, up and down, et cetera. And then we've got uh, narrow and wide fields of view. And then we can also use this to adjust the track gate. So when we're looking at an object, like say a moving target, we can essentially draw this dashed box around it and then pull the trigger on the controller here and lock onto that target. So if it's a moving vehicle, we can just keep the FLIR locked onto it. And as we maneuver the aircraft, that FLIR will stay more or less locked on. Most sensors have some kind of a capability like that, um, but it's just a nice feature, especially like for example, again, if we're doing over water stuff and we're trying to do a hoist to a boat that's moving at 15 knots, we can keep the sensor locked on. So as we position the aircraft, we always uh, see where the sensor is looking at. We have five radios or five line of sight radios in the PaveHawk. So that's what this intercom or uh, controller is. So we can we've got one, two, three, four, five radios and then our two nav beacons or our nav uh, audio. So if we're flying like a VOR or a TACAN, we can use these pins to listen to that. So that's just how we choose what radio we want. If I want to talk on RT3, I can uh, go to RT3. Speaking of radios, we've got two control heads here. Like I talked about earlier, this is the Lars radio, which is our radio number four, but this control head is essentially defunct now. They just haven't done the work to remove it. So it functions as an off, off, on off switch, and then everything else we do with it, frequencies, um, settings, anything for that is done with the Smartnum SCD. But the two line of sight radios we have here are two tens, and each of these control heads uh, controls two radios, or for a total of four radios. So we get one, two, three, four, and five radios total. Uh, two of those radios are SATCOM capable or satellite communications, so we can uh, talk to people literally anywhere in the world with satellite communications, um, but they also do normal line of sight radio, so FM, which is something ground forces like the Army likes to use, um, or VHF, UHF, whatever you want to talk on, the ARC-210s can probably do it. So these are the control heads, uh, again, for those ARC-210s. This panel down here is our IHAS, the improved uh, altitude and hover hold system. This uh, system runs off our navigation for both our, our INS uh, for motion and then also our GPS for position and then uses the trim actuators on top of the aircraft to hold the hover. So uh, we can use this for holding a specific position. It's great for like uh, when we do 600 pound weight checks on our hoist and we have to hover at 200 feet and pick all, uh, send out all 200 feet of cable with 600 pounds on it. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to hover at those higher altitudes. So we can just double tap the switch here to hold the position. And then with this dial, we can dial up or down the, the uh, altitude and it holds a nice stable uh, hover for us or you know so anytime the pilot workload is too much you're super you're super tired and you're holding long hover you can engage AHAS and it will hold the hover for you uh, down here on the left this is our transponder uh, as well as our uh, mode 4 in there so that's IFF or uh, identify friend or foe uh, so if we're flying in the inner th in the theater and uh, a fighter interrogates us we can reply with the correct codes um, this is our large control like I talked about earlier that's not used. Uh, this is the control panel for the ALE-47, which is what's going to dispense our chaff and flare. So this system talks to the missile warning and the RWR and will expend the correct uh, amount and timing of expendables for either chaff or flare depending on the threat uh, that's being uh, shot at us. Uh, this switch right here is just our, our VAS or voice altitude warning system. Uh, it barks at you. It says low altitude if you're flying too low. Um, so. This is how we can adjust the volume for that. Uh, this is the control panel for the RWR, so we can turn it on and adjust the volume. Uh, this is the uh, ARCAM, which is the ALQ-144. We don't fly with that in theater anymore, uh, but when we get on top of the aircraft, I can talk a little bit more about that defensive system. And then we've got the uh, miscellaneous uh, switch panel here, uh, specifically the tail wheel. Like I talked about earlier, if we want to unlock or unlock the tail wheel, we just hit this switch here. And then uh, if we have uh, some problem with the tail rotor and we need to go to the backup tail rotor servo, we can flip the switch, uh, but normally it does it automatically. And then last but not least on the center console here, we've got our gun uh, system control. So this is the master arm switch. So I can flip that up and that arms the weapons. And then we can either put them in side fire for the back enders, or if we're doing fixed forward fire, we can put them to forward. But this controls the uh, guns uh, out back. On the left side of the uh, 
aft center console here, we've got our TACAN as well as our VOR, so for flying instruments. And we can also use that TACAN for air to air station keeping if we're doing HAR or uh, just formation flight, we can determine distance that way. Uh, we've got bright and dim switches for ALA 47 and then an antenna, a SATCOM antenna switch uh, to choose either between Zenith or Horizon on the antenna. And again, you'll see some blank spots on the aft center console here. Uh, that's because over the years we've added equipment, but then maybe shrunk it down and taken it out. Uh, so for example, with the upgraded radio control heads here, we used to have two here, uh, one here, and then one back here. But instead of reconfiguring this whole console to take up some of that empty space, they just put some blank panels on here. And so that's one of the big things you'll notice uh, uh, if you watch the whiskey video, the HH60 whiskey, is this whole thing is basically gone because we're, we don't need it. Uh, up here, we've got a bunch of different uh, circuit breakers for uh, different avionics. Um, we've got our switches here for our MFCDs. This is our where we load our flight plans. So we use a what's called the PCMCIA card or PICMA card. It's pretty sweet uh, 1990s technology. I think it's like 256 megabytes or something like that. It's not very big. And this uh, tray right here is actually for a floppy disk. So most people don't know what a floppy disk is, but that is also known as the save symbol on most software. Um, but you can you could load your flight plans on your floppy disk and then put in this bad boy and it actually has an internal heating element if it's really cold like you're at the guard unit in Alaska and your floppy disk won't work when it's too cold it could actually heat up uh, to use it so that's pretty neat uh, we've got our FLIR controller right here that just turns the FLIR on and off our fuel management panel here some of these switches we don't use like these two external tank uh, jettison switches we don't have external tanks so they're useless uh, for us but if we want a fuel dump we've got this guarded switch here that we can hit to dump fuel and then this is how we can choose different uh, pumps that we want to use to transfer the fuel uh, from the aux tanks into the main tanks, as well as extend the probe. So we can put our mode select the probe, uh, auto, pump to, and then it will get a uh, unlocked light. The probe will go out. You hear a little thump when it locks into place and you get a ready light. And then you're good to do some AR with uh, the Kings. Uh, we've got fuel boost pumps here. The Blackhawk originally was designed to have a, a negative pressure or vacuum fuel system. So the engines would suck fuel, but then if they got a leak, let's say they took a bullet, instead of that f fuel going everywhere, uh, it would just suck some air and you'd lose the engine. So the thought process being, this is a really powerful aircraft. If we lose an engine, that's better than having fuel spraying everywhere and burning everyone. Uh, but when you're flying this thing at 22,000 pounds in the mountains of Afghanistan, uh, which is our max gross weight, you don't want to be losing engines because you have no alternative. So we have this positive pressure fuel system so we can turn these bad boys on uh, to essentially override that suction fuel system and give positive pressure uh, to the fuel lines. We just got some uh, toggle switches here uh, specifically to turn our nav system on. Um, so when we get in the aircraft and we want to start aligning the INSs and stuff, we can just hit that. And then this switch panel here is for our VSDS or visual symbology display system or video symbology display system. Uh, there's actually two controllers, but only one of them really uh, has anything. We used to have a HUD. Uh, way back in the day, there was a monocle that clipped onto your NVGs, and it would allow you to see certain things like airspeed and I think your hover cues. Uh, but for whatever reason, people didn't like it. It was tethered to the aircraft, and it was just it was older technology. It was like good for the time, but wasn't as good as what we have today. So anyways, we don't use it anymore, but we still use that panel to control the hover symbology. So like I talked about earlier, we can see our FLIR picture here, but then let's say we're flying a brownout landing uh, where we're going to kick up a bunch of dust. You know, most pilots, uh, fixed wing especially, are used to flying in the clouds and uh, IMC. So they climb up and two, three hundred feet, they punch in the clouds and they're IMC until they land. For helicopters, it's usually the opposite. Or we're flying around VFR the whole time until we land in a brownout and we, we enter the dust at 50 or 60 feet above the ground. And then we're essentially IMC until we touch down. So that can get a little sketchy. So what we have are we have hover cues so that we can fly to a point in space without being able to actually see outside. Because most flying, especially hovering, is completely visual. And we like to look at the 45 or off the nose or out the side, and we'll move the controls to put the aircraft in position. But with the hover cues, we have an instantaneous vertical velocity on the right side, so we can really um, shack whatever sync rate we're trying to achieve. We have torque on the left side, we have a heading tape across the top, and then in the center, we have essentially a ball and a stick. And so if you keep that lined up either forward or aft as in a decel, then you know you're gonna land more or less safely. But if you, your stick starts moving left or right, that means you're drifting left or right. So once you hit the ground, you could potentially roll the aircraft. So we use these hover cues a lot uh, over water. When you're hovering over water, it tends to blow away from you from the rotor downwash. So it's really hard to uh, determine whether you're moving or not. And so we'll use the cues for that. Or like I said, landing in a brownout or like we have a guard unit in Alaska, they fly in the snow a lot. So using that in a whiteout for the snow gives you uh, essentially like flying instruments, but it allows you to take it to the ground if there's any uh, 
anything obscuring your vision. Um, so that's pretty much it for the, the center console here. Obviously, we've got some aircraft forms here. Uh, this is a map case as well as down there uh, on the co-pilot side. Uh, up top here, this is a, a light. It's blue and either blue or white, depending on uh, if you're nighttime or just it's dark out. These little brackets here and these plugs actually uh, go with our JSAM system. And it's essentially a, a gas mask system that has positive pressure um, that we can use. So if we have to fly this helicopter into a, a situation that's been contaminated, we put on these masks and these respirator things, and then we can hook up the blower system onto these brackets and plug them in here so we can go into contaminated uh, situations without uh, breathing that bad stuff. Up top here, we've got some more circuit breakers. We've got the cargo hook controls here, which we I have never used. I think uh, some of the guard units use them for certain missions, but for the most part, the active duty units don't use them. Uh, different electrical controls, so we've got external power, battery, and then APU gen, and uh, number one and number two gens. Uh, over here, we've got these real stats for lights, and we have some more over here. Our windshield wiper controls, um, as well as the heater controls, which uh, the heater in this thing is uh, doesn't work so great. It works decent up front, the back enders don't get much heat and the PJs get no heat. So on a long sortie, especially like uh, over Iraq in the winter time, they are frozen and I feel really bad for them uh, as I'm roasting up here with the heat cranking. I've got more lighting switches up here with our backup hydraulic pump switch, our leak test switch so we can check the automatic leak detection isolation system on the ground. And then we were talking about those slime lights earlier, those green strip lights, that's our intensity adjustment there. We can, uh, here's a little bit more APU controls with the APU switch here. Uh, APU T handle, so if the APU catches on fire, we can pull that and dispense uh, the, one of the fire bottles into it. Switches up here, we've got windshield anti-ice. All three windshields have, it's very hard to see, especially on camera, you're probably not gonna get it, but there's a very fine metal mesh that's bonded into the glass. And you can see the wire connections up here. Um, that's how they're, they're electrically powered. And so when we're flying in icing conditions, uh, obviously if you have ice on the windscreen, you can't see. And so you can hit these switches up here and they will turn that uh, anti-ice, uh, windshield anti-ice on and it will heat the windscreens screens up pretty significantly to keep all of the ice off of it. Uh, additionally, like we talked about earlier, we have blade de-ice. Um, that's the controller for that is actually on the back uh, with the, the right seater. And then we have engine anti-ice. And so that's what's controlled here. And so the engine inlets siphon that hot bleed air from the engines and heat those engine inlet, uh, inlets really hot so no ice can build up. Uh, so that's one, that was one of the design requirements that the Army set, you know, uh, especially back in the 70s. Uh, 1976 is when they awarded the Black Hawk uh, project. And, uh, you know, they've got bases in Germany and all over the world. And if you're going to be, uh, you know, fighting the commies uh, in Poland, you're going to want some anti-ice and de-ice capabilities. And so that was built into this aircraft. Uh, obviously, that threat uh, doesn't exist uh, quite the same way that it did back then. But it's still great to have uh, poor weather uh, systems so your aircraft can fly in those icing conditions. Lastly, up here, we've got our two throttles. Uh, the Army calls them PCLs or power control levers. And on the Whiskey, we're also calling them PCLs, but for whatever reason, on the G, we call them throttles. Um, but these really don't have too many positions. When you start the aircraft, you hit this button here, and that's what sends the bleed air from the APU to the starter. And then once the engine gets to a certain speed, you can throw this forward to idle, and it'll start the engine. And then when you want to fly, both of your throttles will be at idle. You just pull them out a little bit, and they're not working because we don't have power applied. But uh, and they will go forward to uh, fly. And so once they're in the fly position, they just stay there. It's not like old school helicopters where they had a twist grip throttle and they had to keep the engine RPMs uh, in line with the NR or the rotor RPM. Uh, once they're in fly, you can just basically pull up and out on the collector, do whatever you want, and the engines more or less stay the same speed. And that's, that's pretty standard for, uh, for turbine powered helicopters. Uh, lastly, up on the throttle uh, quadrant up here, we've got these two T handles. Uh, so these are fuel selectors, which allow our fuel to go either from the main tanks or the op draw from the opposite tank. What this fuel selector does is it turns them off and then it also arms the fuel uh, extinguisher for that engine. So if we get a, a number two engines uh, on fire, instead of having to turn the fuel selector off to shut off the fuel flow and then pull the T handle, it just does it all in one motion. Uh, we've got vent blowers up here. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have air conditioning uh, in the Pavehawk here. So we get some nice hot air from outside. So it's really fun when you're flying like Southern Arizona, it's 110 degrees outside and you're gonna land in a brownout and you forgot that you left your vent blower on, which is just sucking unfiltered air from outside. And then you get 110 degree dust blown in your face uh, when you do the brownout. Uh, so that's always exciting. Um, on your greenhouses up here, these uh, plexiglass greenhouses allow us to see up. So when we're in like a really steep turn, we can kind of see through the turn 
and on either side we have a thermometer uh, to let us know the outside uh, air temperature so that we can calculate power uh, appropriately. Down here uh, on the center windscreen we've got our standby magnetic compass. Uh, I've never had a failure where I had to use that but we do have that option if we need to fly off the old standby. Um, and then up here on my side it's hard to see uh, from that vantage point but we have a rotor brake and so this is just a hand powered hydraulic rotor brake that we can apply to stop the rotors and we can lock it in place if we want to start the engines without letting the rotors spin. Uh, we don't use it that often but the Navy is really big on that in their 60s so they can get the engine started without rotor blades spinning and being a danger to all the, the sailors working on the flight deck up there. Uh, so then once, if we've started the engine and we've got the rotor brake on, we can just release it and the rotor starts spinning and then we'll put the engine, the throttles to fly and we can take off. But it's really nice uh, for like, especially windy days when you're shutting down because you'll shut the engines off and then the blades will just keep spinning because the wind will kind of keep windmilling them. So you can get on that rotor brake and stop them uh, and get out of the, the, the cockpit uh, on time. Down here we've got our parking brake. So this is how we set the parking brake. Uh, the brakes are operated individually. Uh, each pedal uh, has its own, it controls its own brake and you just push forward on the pedals like on most uh, aircraft to set the brakes uh, on the wheels. We've got our, obviously our anti-torque pedals down here with these micro switches. Um, so the, the 60 will normally uh, hold the heading for you, but if you press these micro switches in, it overrides it uh, so that you can control it manually. And then we've got a pedal adjust here. So these pedals move forward and aft uh, for comfort in the size of the, the pilot. On our collective here, like I said earlier, we have a, a trigger on the bottom here, that's our collective trim. So we can pull up or push down on the collective and then release the trigger, and that will more or less hold the collective there. I've got landing light controls, the emergency hook release for the cargo hook. Uh, searchlight not only turns it on and off, but adjusts the intensity of it. And then you can move the searchlight with this uh, little toggle uh, here. This is the primary servo. So when we get on top of, the air, top of the aircraft, we'll talk about that. But essentially, if one of your primary hydraulic systems that control the flight controls uh, gets shot out or doesn't work, we can isolate it with this switch. This is contingency power. So this is something that we added on to the Payfox, especially after working in uh, with heavy weights in uh, areas where we don't have a lot of power. Uh, the engines normally temperature limit at 10 minutes, but we can override that by going into our two and a half minute limit by simply hitting the switch. Normally uh, in your standard, your original UH-60 configuration, the only way you could get that into that power band was if essentially if you lost one of your engines. But this kind of allows us to trick that by just hitting that switch and it gets a little bit more power uh, from a situation where we need it. And this is our intercom and radio switch. Uh, left and right used to control the HUD settings, but we don't use it anymore. So now we just pull up to talk uh, because our Vox doesn't really work that well because especially if we're doors off and we're shooting guns, uh, a lot of that background noise will trigger the microphone. So we won't have hot mics or Vox, we'll just pull up to talk and then whatever radio we've selected on our ICS here, we can just push down and that allows us to key that radio. Uh, you just don't want to do it on the wrong radio. So sometimes you think you're talking to your formation on RT1 and you're actually talking to a tower controller on RT2 and you forget you're on RT2 and then uh, they call you back with uh, Jolly, uh, what was that, say again? And then you look like an idiot. Um, but that's the collective. For our cyclic control here, uh, talking about the stabilator earlier, early on in the Blackhawks life, they had some instances where people were killed because that stabilator, for whatever reason, programmed down while they were in cruise flight. And that what that does is it pushes the nose down. So this is a pinky slew switch. And what we can do is we can hit this with our pinky. And when we pull that, it overrides any of the automatic controls of the stabe and allows it to slew up as long as we're pulling it. So if I just wanted to move it up a little bit, I would just pull it. Uh, but generally speaking, if you're using this, it's a big, it's an emergency. And so you're just gonna squeeze the life out of this thing until the stabe programs all the way up. Because once it's level, in cruise flight, it's perfectly fine that way. In a hover, again, it, your nose attitude's a little bit higher, but it's not the end of the world. It just changes your sight picture a little bit. So that was, uh, that's as far as I know, again, all 60s have that. This is a safety uh, mechanism. This guarded switch is for our triggers for up front. So talking about earlier with the 50 cals, if we're doing fixed forward fire, uh, the back enders will lock them forward and then we'll adjust our gun control switches back here to forward fire. And then whoever's flying the aircraft, when they're ready to shoot, we'll lift the guard on this and then pull the trigger and that shoots the guns. Uh, this is just our trim interrupt here. Uh, so trim on a helicopter works a little bit differently than on a fixed wing platform. Uh, with this, it essentially, it's essentially holding the flight controls wherever we want them. Uh, so when I trim this, when I press this button, it releases that trim. So then when I move the cyclic somewhere and let go of the button, it holds it more or less there. This button here, like I talked about earlier, is for the AHAs if I want to engage that. Uh, this is our <clears throat> dispense consent switch for the automatic dispensing of flares and chaff. Um, so if we need, if we're having an auto setting and it's uh, it's asking us, hey, I'm ready to shoot, we can press this and it will punch them out. And then we can do that manually here, uh, forward with flare or aft with chaff, uh, depending on what kind of a threat we're fighting. 
this uh, little uh, switch here is the same as the trim. It works in the same way. It just, it does it, it moves the stick for you. So this button is the trim interrupt and I press the button, move the stick and then let go. That's good for like fairly large control inputs. But if I'm flying instruments or I just want to do a little bit of an input, I can just beep the switch left or right, up and down, and that will either adjust the, the nose up or down and the, the uh, aircraft left or right. We have the cable shear here. Uh, so this is obviously an emergency situation where maybe we have a, we're hoisting someone on the rescue hoist and the cable gets caught. Let's say we're hoisting them off a ship and the cable gets wrapped around the railing of the ship or something. That doesn't really happen that often, but if we needed to, we can shear the, the hoist. And so the back enders uh, on the right seat at least has a shear switch as well, but we can do that from up front here. It's just a button that we press and there's a little explosive charge that shoots a blade at the cable in the hoist and it chops that cable. So you obviously it could bring down the whole helicopter if you had a cable wrapped around a ship or something like that. So in a worst case situation, we could shear that hoist. Uh, obviously we can't use the hoist until it's fixed, but at least it keeps us from crashing. And then in a similar vein, uh, if we have someone on the hoist and maybe the back ender who's running the hoist takes a bullet or for whatever reason can't run the hoist, we can control the hoist cable up and down right here. We don't have this, the variable speed control that they have back there. And obviously we can't really look over our shoulder and see that well, and we can't control, certainly can't control the cable, but we can at least reel it in or out. Uh, so if we need to do that for whatever reason, we have that option. And then lastly, this red switch on the side is just our windshield wiper switch. Uh, so if we're flying, we can hit this bad boy, turns the wipers on, hit it again and turn it off. And it just keeps you from having to reach up uh, on the upper console to, to hit the wipers. Uh, we've got more circuit breakers back here, some more uh, vents uh, for the vent blower. So one of the things uh, that they designed into the 60 uh, was a mechanical mixing unit for the flight controls. On a, an older helicopter like a Huey, when you apply power, uh, you have to put in manually put in different flight control inputs uh, to keep the aircraft straight. So for example, on the 60 or a Huey, uh, because the blades spin from right to left, you have to apply left pedal to keep the nose straight. Uh, but when you apply left pedal, that also means there's thrust on the tail rotor and now the aircraft wants to slide to the right. And so that's called translating tendency. So because of that, you have to put in left cyclic. And then because the rotor mast is tilted forward, you have to apply aft cyclic. And the rotor mast uh, on most helicopters is tilted forward so that in forward flight, because the rotor disc is generally gonna be tilted forward anyways, you already have some tilt built in and the 60 it's three degrees um, so that the fuselage is more or less level because otherwise, if they were both perfectly perpendicular when you're flying around, you'd be staring at the ground uh, from the cockpit. So all that to say, you have to put in collective to pick up, left pedal to keep your nose straight, left cyclic to keep the aircraft over the line, and then aft cyclic to keep it from moving forward because of that uh, forward tilt. And for a young guy going through Fort Rucker like myself flying a TH-1, that's challenging because you got all these flight inputs. So going to the 60, because they designed the mechanical mixing unit, it does that all of that for you. So you still have to put in some inputs, but the aircraft holds a heading for you. When you pull your collective in, it automatically puts in a little bit of left pedal, gives you a little bit of aft and left cyclic, and just generally makes it easier to fly and hold it over the spot. So that's a really nice feature. And then earlier we were talking about the tail rotor and how it's canted. So when you put in left pedal, that will push the nose down. And when you put in right pedal, it will lift it up. Because of that, Sikorsky also designed uh, that pitch to yaw mixing. So when you put in left pedal, it applies opposite uh, cyclic so that your nose doesn't push down. And then conversely, when you put in right pedal, it will provide opposite cyclic so that your nose doesn't come up. So all that to say, when they designed this helicopter, they made it a pilot's helicopter by making it a lot easier to fly. We've got our SAS and our FPS down here and we've got our mechanical mixing unit. So for the most part, uh, it's, it's, not, it's much easier to fly than like an older helicopter like a Huey. A uh, few other things that I've kind of failed to mention. We've got a map light here. We rarely ever use it, but that uh, it does exist. We normally have little battery powered lights on our fingers. And then sitting on these seats, these are ballistically protected seats, which is again, something that the army designed in. They're, the Huey seats, that they, the lessons they learned from Vietnam is just they weren't terribly survivable. Um, so they have ballistically uh, tolerant seats. And then you'll see, you might not be able to tell that well, but there's a really large space underneath the seats. And these seats were designed to stroke down. When I first started the video, I talked about uh, how the aircraft was designed for crash worthiness. And so when that 60 comes in, what you really wanna do is land it more or less wheels down, obviously, and straight down, because those struts and the uh, main landing gear will absorb that impact, and then the seats will stroke down, I think up to 12 inches to absorb that impact. So it's kind of like an airbag going off, but obviously we don't have airbags, but it's, it's something to absorb the energy so you're not just smacking your face off the instrument panel or, or jarring your back when you land hard. So again, that's some of those little things that they, they designed in um, that were kind of, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but were fairly big deals, especially comparing them to their uh, what they were supposed to replace, which was the Huey. That's our walk around of the HA-60G Payfock. 
uh, thanks for watching. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, hit us up in the comments section and I can uh, hopefully answer those questions for you. The guns.